the opposite of that. The reason you are giving bread is so that you can add to other people's life. You can improve the quality of other people's life. You can take the life of other people further. You can add value to other people's life. And secondly, you can do the same to your maker. Now, what you call hell, the, the Lord explained to me why he created hell. He said hell is like dustbin. You know, in Lagos, there's one we have near Maryland. Not only that they dump all the rub, you know, rubbish for Lagos in our place, they also set it on fire. Around, outside the walls of Jerusalem, they have a place like that. You know, a valley of Hermon. That's actually from where they got this thing they call Gehenna. They call it Gehenna. It's always 24 hours aflame. Because that's where they dump all the rubbish from the city. All their mess that have been useless. They've removed all the stuff. That's where it is now dumped. So it's always burning because you have to keep burning. God said hell is the dustbin where he dumps wasted lives. They didn't make spiritual sense and they didn't make natural sense. They didn't add value to him that made them. They didn't add value to their fellow men. A life as lived, pursuing self-gratification, selfish achievement, selfish ambition, will end there. If success is what you think it is, it should be the fastest passport to heaven. But when that rich man said, my ban has expanded, all the things, oh my soul, relax. You have wealth laid for you for eternity. You don't have anything. You have enough money to take care of your generation to come. God did not wait one more minute. He said that night, he called him a big fool. He said, your soul is required for him, you. Now, a lot of people are preaching that money is what this, it's not money. It's turning the means to an end. He achieved those breakthroughs, those success, to use it now to go for the essence of life. To use it now to fund the real essence of life. And he turned that means into his end. Now, that's why the day I die, I'm going to die with a smile on my face. Not coming from my mouth, but coming from the level of peace I carry within my spirit. I carry an impeccable peace inside me. If you see how I live, man, the constituency of my inward man, I don't have stress. I don't have cares. The only thing that gives me burden is when I look at what is in the heart of the master and look at how far below. We are. That's the only thing. And then when I want to carry that, it becomes too big for me. I realize again, I have to put it in his hand. That he's the only one that can help us to do that. By us that, we will fail. And so, what is this thing that we are pursuing to kill ourselves? What is that thing? Finds then in the eyes of God, nothing means anything. The means is not what God counts. The end is what it counts. If the means is hooked up towards the end, to God, whether it's a plane you are flying, he knows you're going around the nation, going, no problem. But if he finds means in your hands and the end abandoned, you join that rich man. People are going to hell from church. Oh. Because you think a lot of people are saying, because we told them to come to the altar and just confess something then Jesus will be wrong if he said, not all who call me Lord, Lord, shall be saved. Not all. Yet the scripture said, everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For upon Mount Zion there shall be delivered. Yet the man said, not all. That means there is fake conversion and fake profession. Because we show the fake article to them. The same crusade dollar carried in the drug industry to save the lives of our people are held. We need to carry in the church to salvage the precious faith that was once delivered to the saints. Now, we've left the essence of life. The essence of life. Natural life is given for purpose. What about spiritual life? It's given for another type of purpose. That's why when you say your purpose is your passion and all that, you are operating like a fallen man. Because I can teach that to Mandela. He finds his aspiration, finds that. You have only preached the gospel that can preach to Adam's generation. 
The purpose of the new creation is to live the life and to extend the mission of Jesus. Can I say it again? That's why in spiritual reproduction, what we reproduce is Christ in people. That's what we reproduce. And in apprenticeship and followership, what people are to follow is Christ in the leader. Somebody, let me say this. You know, it's no contradiction with what has been taught yesterday, but I just want to make this clear. You know, Apostle Ben has talked about, like me, and I, I'm the one being used, for example, in most of the illustrations. Okay, you have to follow your pastor, follow your pastor's teaching. Watch. The level of Christ's content in me is what you are to follow. The one that is Adam, the fallen, the, the self, whatever, is what you are to leave out. If not, you will miss your destiny. Maybe I should say it this way. I don't know why I'm facing that way. What? Maybe they are pulling more out of me than you guys or what? Eh? Do you know that the depth of what God unfolds depends on who he is talking to? Hmm? Do you know that you can feed an adult what a baby cannot eat? How many of you know that? Hello, are you still here? Are you getting what we are discussing at all? Don't you care about the state of the church now? Do you know how many governors, presidents, as at now in the last 10 years or 11 years, we are producing two Christian presidents from the body of Christ? And Nigeria is still like this. What do you think is wrong? They are living exactly the messages we are preaching. They are living a breakthrough, self-driven success messages that we are preaching. And that's what the, the man wants to succeed. He wants to break. He, when he, you land at Asorok, you tell yourself, ah, I have arrived. But God said, be ye holy for I am. Be ye perfect as your heavenly father is. So he doesn't tell us to do anything until he first has it in his character. The point I say I came here to make is that in following people, what you follow is Christ in them because that is the goal of your new birth. The purpose of your new birth is that you might be conformed to the image of Christ so that he can be the firstborn among what? That all this talk where he must lead you to. That is your promised land. Your promised land is not a breakthrough. Your promised land is two basic things. It's not a breakthrough. The first is Christ likeness. The second is fulfilling the purpose and the mission of Christ. Stop looking for your purpose. Your purpose is in the vine. Ask yourself why the vine exists. What it's supposed to do. That's why you are better than the one that is not born again. The one that is not born again can find this purpose that are teaching you like every other person. The gate is fulfilling purpose. Mandela has fulfilled purpose. Maybe your culture has actually fulfilled its purpose. If that is what they teach you, they have destroyed you. Then the new race is useless. There was no need for it. There was no need for it. That is falling again from your high calling in Christ. Paul talks about the mark of my high calling in Christ. It is not your natural destiny. It is your destiny in Christ. In other words, what you need to understand is that you have a natural destiny. Then you have your spiritual destiny. The high calling is your spiritual destiny, not your natural destiny. Does it mean you don't do fulfill your natural destiny? No. No. What it means is that apostle, you know, if my purpose as a human being created by God is to be a medical doctor, that's my destiny in life, my natural destiny. I'm not the only one who is called to do that. There could be other doctors who are not even born again. One can even be a Buddhist monk and he might even fulfill that one more than me. 
that is professing Christianity. It's true. A guy in India, in, in Bangladesh, has fulfilled purpose in eradicating poverty in that nation. He's not a believer. He's a Hindu man. The bank of the poor. And he revolutionized the concept of microfinance system and changed the world by that. But the same thing has come to Nigeria. He has his fueling human ambition and whatever. It's not what that man did that they are doing with microfinance system here. Of course, they're even charging more than the banks, the commercial banks. Now, let's assume, watch now, watch now, watch now, that my natural purpose is like Professor Yunus, I hope I'm pronouncing his name well, Yunus, to actually fight poverty and eradicate poverty. That's my natural purpose. And I'm doing it here in Nigeria. Why he's doing it? He's a Hindu doing it in, in, in India. I'm a Christian doing it in Nigeria. That's right. There's nothing wrong with that. You should do that. But that is not the high calling. The reason I was recreated and raised from spiritual death and given a divine nature is because there is another thing that is coming from heaven I need to implement. When I use this, I call this bank for the poor, project for the poor, a platform, not my end. It's my halfway to destiny. So when I start affecting thousands, I now turn that place into a church. When I say by church, I don't mean turn it into a congregation the way you do a Catholic church or a Pentecostal church. It means that I need to take the kingdom of God the message of redemption, the message of the kingdom, and bring it into that place, what happens is that because I've already affected their physical need, help them break this, they will hardly resist the entrance of the kingdom. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? In the eyes of God, I'm not a banker, I'm not a businessman running, dealing with poverty, I'm not a social worker. In the eyes of God, I'm an apostle that use the social tool, the economic tool, to reach millions of people that normal church, locked within the pulpit normal, will not have reached. But you know what we are teaching our people? When we now teach them this fallen purpose, they just reproduce after the natural Adam. They can give people food, to give medical treatment, and leave those souls to perish. In Paul's mission, Jesus specified what should be done to the Gentiles' nature. He said to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, the third one, that they might receive inheritance among them that are sanctified in me. If you feed their body, if you give them all that, Jesus did it, but he warned the people he was feeding. If you eat this food, this bread, you will die. Your fathers ate such manner, God gave it to them, but they perish. But there's another bread that comes from heaven. The reason God gives capacity to give the natural bread is so that he can use it to open their heart, knowing that you have gained their trust, so you can now offer them that spiritual bread. If you fail to do it, you have crushed the plan of God. You and Adam live at the same level. You think Adam was a bad guy? If you meet him, you probably won't think he had much problem. Is it just this one fruit that you are killing the guy for? He wasn't a real bad guy because he hadn't committed some of the things some of you have committed. That means when a new creation is called into the medical profession, He's not just a doctor. The medicine is a platform for him. He's a missionary. He's an apostle. That's why he's, because he walks with God, he's sensitive to know. Sometimes somebody can be dying and come to his hospital. He can't pay. He sees it as an opportunity. He will say, you know our policy here. We don't treat people. Go, go to them. You can't, we can't treat you. He has in mind that he will treat him, but he wants him to feel the system first. The guy will be crying. He said, we don't have any. Uh, no, there is a standard here. Go to whatever. Carry your father to, you know, whatever, and pay and take it. Then he will go home and leave them. 
Then the next day he comes. He said, where is that man that came here yesterday? I, I, whatever. Now said he wasn't able to pay. They said, we have sent him. He said, call him. He comes. He said, you know, we don't do like this here. But while I was praying this morning, the Lord, Jesus asked me to treat you. He said, because he died for you, that I shouldn't allow you to waste. Then he provides the man medical treatment. He knows that that does not happen. Doctors, Adams, generation of doctors, you don't know anything. They have become so hard that they don't care about human beings anymore. And there are pastors like them who don't care about anything, yet they overflux. They don't care about human beings. They are there to succeed. They use every human being to drive their ambition of success, what they want to drive, and float around and slaughter lives. Yet the true shepherd lays down life to advance people. But you know, after he has germinated, after death, become a tree, he bears much fruit. In that fruit, if he now wants to eat a hundred fruit, he can eat because he has fed a generation. Because the harvest for a mother is after you not only go through travel to bring a child, you have nurtured him into a man. Then your harvest starts. That's the harvest in ministry. It's a result. Oh, years of sacrifice, service, and investment. People now make it their goal. Want to go to, into ministry to succeed. Doom souls who think that godliness is a means to gain. No. Godliness produces fruit of gain. It has profit for the life there is, but it has profit for the life there is to come. So medicine is not your calling for the new creation. It's a platform. You see, government going into winning election is not a calling, it's a platform. Can you imagine a governor that understands this? So he's now a pastor of a whole state. The way he will run that administration, the way he will do his policies, is the way a true man of God is supposed to run a church. I'm not talking about just prayer, you know, those kind of things. He can have people, create people who pray. And at the end, he has established righteousness in that land and brought the kingdom of God and given it taproot in his state. That state will now become an example because what happens is that where Satan has the upper hand, they know they have problem. But who will set the right example? Then they will start coming over there to want to find out like they did in the time of Solomon. How, what did you do? How come there's so much peace here? So much security? How come people don't have crime like we have? He said, the people that should have been stealing, I have discipled all of them. They have jobs. We have trained them. We have equipped them with skill. The educational system well. He said, why come you are not having strike? I said, the teachers. I have given the lecturers, the teachers, a sense of mission. They have found this thing, not just a means to any living, but they have found it as something to live for and die for. That the training of the next generation of leaders is a calling. That education is not a profession. It's more than a profession. This fallen Adam and his children see it only as a profession a means to eat. But for us, there is a calling. It's a platform to express divine purpose. So everything, pulpit, now you say you have arrived. Arrive what? There's a gather people. You don't know you have multiplied the amount of judgment you are going to face in the judgment seat of Christ. Because the question, you're going to give account for what happened to those people. How are you going to face Jesus that day? That's what I love about him. You know, when people are around, they discuss Pastor Sunday, he has set a standard that is so high. Because the Christ life is so high above what you find everywhere. When I listen, discussions are going, you watch him. Each time he says, he's after the life 
that produce what people are saying. He's always after the life. That's how you win souls, my friend. That's how you influence lives. You leave the person. And then you call him up and all of that. You just rescue him. You now take it one step further to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God. That's from Satan's government to they come over and submit to the government of Christ. And beyond that, that they might obtain inheritance among them that are sanctified in me. God's goal is not just to give people physical bread and they still die and perish. God's goal is to finally land them in the promised land. They are still remaining a rest for the people of God. Whatever you do that add value, any form of service, it will affect how you work in your industry. Because if you know that you're going to be able to talk to your boss one day about his eternal destiny, you won't be the one coming late. You won't be the one because you have already destroyed the message before you preached it. You have already dis destroyed Christ's image in that place. You will carry yourself well. You will be the one running around with guys in the office. If you're going to be the one that when your colleagues are having a marriage problem, you will go and help reconcile them. That's the ministry. You will not be the one messing around, going for useless dates that does not have purpose behind it. It's not about you, my friend. It's not about you. There's a higher purpose than you. Life does not revolve around you. You're not the center of gravity. You are not. Christ is. Wasted lives are dumped in the dustbin. Gehenna. Then the precious fruit of the earth that are picked out of all the are the ones that are put in paradise. Let me end it this way. Let me end it this way. What are we producing? What are we producing? That they might be conformed to the image of Christ so that he can be the firstborn among many brethren. Now let me now explain that image of Christ. And that's where I want to end it. The essence of salvation, the essence of redemption is a life of total obedience to God. Put back that scripture is to move human beings from that Adam's nature that for the purpose of self can betray the father that they will imbibe the nature and the lifestyle of the second Adam that lives totally for the fulfillment of God's will. Look at how he said it. He said, I came from heaven, sir. He said, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's why he called Peter Satan. See, because you are not interested in the will of God. You are interested in what we have. Just human beings. Watch. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. I just observe the Father. Whatever he wants, whatever he's doing, that's what I represent on earth. You know, there's a song, I think we sang it yesterday. As you are, you have made me here on earth. My life here is to be the express image of Christ. Just like he was the express image of the Father. That is my purpose. In it, I find my mission. I find my assignment. In it, I find the life I'm called to live. There's no confusion about my purpose. What am I alive to do? I'm a branch of a vine. The only fruit I can bear is the fruit of the vine. I cannot be bearing the fruit of a fig or the fruit of an orange. Find the purpose of the vine and you have found your purpose. The branch is the fruit-bearing fruit arm of the vine. 
Now, see why Jesus lived a life of total obedience. First, to redeem us, you know, by bearing the consequences of our sin. But second, to set a pattern of the kind of life the new creation will live. If somebody is conformed to Christ's image, he loses self. He is not self-driven. He is not egocentric. He is not self-gratifying. He lives to fulfill the will of God. You know how he said, he said, Lord, I come as it is written of me in the volume of the books to do your will, O oh God, for the law of my God is within my heart. That's what counts. It is not pulling crowds. It is not being a pastor of a big church. It is not having the best cars. It is have I accomplished the will of God. What he has in mind. He sent Jesus when I'm in a city. What is the plan of God for that city? What is it that he's trying to get done that he has not been able to do? And why is it that heaven is still crying? Who shall I send? Who shall go for us? That life of alignment. That life of alignment with the plan of God in heaven is a purpose for the new creation. The natural man can fulfill his just natural destiny. That's fine. The new creation has something that came from beyond this world. We are a new race of being. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are called that people. You are not of this world, though you live in this world. You are called that, that you might show forth the presence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is what our goal in ministry is. To produce lead men to Christ's likeness. When we have led people to the point of self-cancellation, we have led them to their promised land. When our ministry has led people to the point of self consideration that's where you can say they have arrived. That is the mark of our high calling in Christ. What you see out of that life is a life that is now lived to redeem nations. Those are the two dimensions of it. When you have led people to the point of death to self and total emblazon of the will of God, you have led them to their promised land. The every only thing left now is discipling nations. That life will disciple more people than the message that life will preach. That life will change more life because when it comes to discipling people, so you teach it, his reproduction of life. Adam gave birth according to his image after he has fallen. He produced a man named Seth. The first one he produced became a murderer. The other one you know, he killed his brother. So after they conceived again and produced a man, after their image and likeness, is no more after the God image and God's likeness which he carried before. It is that life that has experienced true personal transformation, conformation to Christ, that now reproduces the kingdom. For the kingdom of God is within people first before it's reproduced in society. It's that life that reproduces it. You can put him in the ministry of education. You can put him in the hospital. You can put him anywhere. You can put him anywhere. He will reproduce Christ's standard of leadership, Christ's standard of righteousness in that place. If you understand only the, the redemptive side of grace and you did not understand the conforming side that makes you you have not understood the gospel. Amen. That is the success of Jesus. He produced 12 men, actually, more than that. Because those 120 that survived everything and was there on the day of Pentecost, yeah. They went beyond bread and butter ministry. Those are the ones that survived. They went beyond come to receive miracle ministry. They went beyond come to use God to achieve your own purpose. They are the ones. They became the seed 
that God planted in the planet for the redemption of the world. Creation will remain in the bondage of corruption till the manifestations of the sons of God. These are the men that he's talking about. These are the men that were brought forth from death. Now their life bears much fruit. The secret of achieving this thing is this thing, spiritual reproduction. That's the secret though. That's where the thing is. It's a small group that we can take deeper and take into this thing. After all this, our shout and crowd thing, it is that small group. Jesus did that crowd thing too. It is that small group that are able to take, made to experience this life. And then out of death, they enter into resurrection life. Is that group that the whole world are waiting for. The whole nation depends on them. What's their sense of salvation? See, your salvation didn't cost you obedience. Now you are saved. God demands total obedience. He demands a life that matches the life that bought it. That's why 2 Corinthians 5 said, he said he died so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again from the dead. Jesus demands from us the same level of submission he gives to the Father. Any life below that, you have missed, missed the mark. You don't understand what this whole thing is all about. Jesus demands from himself. He demands obedience unto death. Do you know what shocked me? He wrote a letter to a, a group of church, one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, and told one of them, the enemy will throw you into prison. There was a heavy persecution coming against you. He's giving them a word of wisdom ahead of time. You'll be thrown into prison. They will kill some of you. He said, be faithful unto them. Hey, well, our success message and breakthrough message will say, I'm coming. When they bring the sword, they won't cut. When they shoot you, the bullet will not penetrate. I'm going to get you out of it. Do you know what he told them? Be faithful unto death. Then I will give you the crown of life. What he's telling them is that if that your city will experience revival, there might be need for the blood of some of the saints to be shed. Don't think that God is a fool that he doesn't know what he's doing. He died so that those who live will no longer live for themselves. If you are risen for coming to Christ, it's so that Christianity will be a means to massage your self-driven egocentric life. You are deceived, my friend. The purpose of Christianity is to eliminate it. It's to eliminate you. Is to eliminate you. Till you can say with Paul, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's no more I that live because I has been cancelled. It is Christ that lives within me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died for me. Until you can say that, Forget about it. Put yourself back in the journey. Put yourself back in the journey. The faith movement has opened the door for the body of Christ to understand the legal side of redemption. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm this. I'm a KK. There's, it's wonderful because it's the foundation. We need to understand that. But if the legal does not translate to the experiential, it has no effect. The purpose of God is that the knowledge of the legal will now lead us to begin to submit our life to the Holy Spirit to work out the experiential in us. Because the Holy Spirit started where Jesus stopped. And he's one that will lead us and he's the word 
to perfection. Is his ministry. Part of it is what he's doing through the fivefold to bring us to the fullness of the stature of Christ. You see, what has been accomplished legally, we need to know. Then we now come to God in prayer and sum submission to the Holy Spirit to work it out in us. It will require a vow of obedience. It will require a life of total submission. Remember, I think, I think to be wise to read this one. Oh, I have some Bible. You can just get ready. I'll read this. I'll, you come and remove it. John chapter 14. Let me, let me read this. Verse 21. Oh, he that had my commandments and kept them, he it is that loveth me. He that lo you see the goal of salvation is obedience. He didn't take your obedience to achieve it, but now you have it. This is what you are saved to do. This is the life you are called to live. He that cut my commandments and kept them, it is he that loved me. He's not the one that cried during worship or that said with mouth. Then he said, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. When we teach the legal side, we tell people the love of the father is unconditional. You don't have to do anything. When you come into Christ, the love of God is perfected in people through obedience. Jesus said, this is why my father loves me. Because I laid down my life for the sheep. He said, for this commandment did I receive of my father. He that had my commandments and keepeth them, he is one that loved me. He that loveth me shall be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. We will talk about the blessings of obedience. When you start walking in a degree of the presence of God, and not just talking about gifts of the Spirit, there are people I've seen carrying some gifts, and they are just building a ministry on those that are dead branches. I'm talking about carrying the tangible presence of God which is one of the mark of the glorious church a church a, a temple a tabernacle that does not have that glory coming to sit on the mercy seat tabernacle in the holiest of holies is an empty vessel the glorious church this entire church is going to manifest the tangibility of God's glory on earth it is one of those elements that will cause the nations to bow he said nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising it's more than an anointing. It's more than gifts. Even though that will be part of it. When you see the kind of life that carries that, that carries God's presence, the scripture said it's a life of obedience. Peter said it in Acts 5.32. He said the Holy Spirit whom the Father gave to them that obey him. Let's see it here. He said, I will come and manifest myself to him. Verse 22. And Judah said unto him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? Then he answered, verse 23. Jesus answered, if any man loves me, he will keep my words. My words. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Moving from divine visitation to divine habitation. He becomes a tabernacle. Then the plan of God is completed. That God doesn't live in those man-made temples like the one Solomon built or like the one Moses built for him. That the church is God's dwelling place through the spirit. That is a tabernacle of his glory. And it is what we can carry from place to place. To subdue nations. To transform nations. We have to become carriers of the glory like the ark. In the Old Testament time. This is why we bring it to a city. The principalities and powers are brought on their knees. And the forces that are held the people captives 
are brought under obedience. And then the nations can be brought under the obedience of faith. We will come and make our boat with him and tabernacle with him. I don't know if there's anything in verse 24. Check it out. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. 